that God, if there really truly was one, would save the earth and every non-human thing on it from us, from us humans. And he went on to write further in his notes that if there were really a righteous, omnipotent God, that that God would have many years before us modernites came into our total fruition have sent a messenger not to save humans from each other or from anything else but to save the rest of the earth from humans hey folks in this case Klaus ain't totally off his locker actually I recently made this seemingly sacrilegious picture to illustrate this very same point it has a messiah like Superman saying is this the sort of power, hocus pocus, and enlightenment the humans expect of me? They desecrate the earth and everything on it and expect me to save them before they restore it? But 500 years ago to Leonardo, a man of science in the town of Vinci, this was at first all just a seemingly silly vision which had visited him. So why was he soon convinced of its prophetic truth? Because, upon waking in the morning so long ago, right after his vision, he spoke of it to several of his fellow townspeople and discovered, much to his amazement, that they had all had the very same vision, the very same night before. And the vision thus became known as the dream of the village of Vinci. The dream Da Vinci. In other words, folks, da in Italian means of. Da, da. Oh, Cloud, is that why you like to say da so much? Why was the sad prophecy labeled a dream? Because it included the forecast that 500 years hence, a man known as the Lone Eagle, as Lindbergh was indeed nicknamed, as I have mentioned, would fly a machine across the troubled waters of Atlantis and deliver the profound but simple message to the world. And the world would be wise enough to take the disciplined and voluntary steps necessary before it was too late. Indeed, that was a dream. And what's very interesting is that 500 years later, the very night Lindbergh returned to St. Louis, Lindbergh had a dream that Leonardo da Vinci was, of all persons, Moses. And Lindbergh's entourage all had the very same dream. Hey, Krauss, how'd you come across this wild Moses da Vinci Lindbergh story? I came across it in the Missouri Historical Society's private Lindbergh archives, which aren't supposed to be made public until 2027. But I must say, I was lucky to come across a maintenance man that wanted me real bad to do a portrait of his wife. Okay, if it involves an historical society, it's got to be true. I close by saying, sadly, the dream Da Vinci had 500 years ago has indeed become a reality today. Let me just pause for a second to show you what Earth's candle of life looked like for hundreds of millions of years before us humans started tampering with it just a couple hundred years ago. What are we going to do about it? My fellow participants in this failing but not necessarily finished human experiment, this potential nightmare da Vinci. Dare we today dream that we can do the seemingly impossible? Only in the very near future, which we have very much unilaterally taken dominion over, will tell. Lastly, but not leastly, I must say, I wonder what Lindbergh, or Leonardo da Vinci for that matter, and all his wisdom, would have answered if they were asked to choose, not between birds or airplanes in the sky, but between man or animals on earth. I hope the choice never has to be made but hope will achieve nothing. Only unselfish actions by all of us can ever achieve what absolutely must be achieved for Earth's life to be restored. To be restored? Hey, Klaus, all that needs to be restored here is the truth. How do we know this whole Lindbergh da Vinci story ain't some tall tale you dreamt up 
get your tree loving point across to global idiots like me, huh? Sure the convenience that Lindbergh is dead and can't talk, huh? My spirit still soars and the story Grouse tells is true. Oh man, okay, holy cow. Who am I to question the word of the departed? Much less the spirit of St. Louis. I apologize, cousin, you're accused. Well, I've said my piece and I'm going now off the camera for good. I'm going to go take a little nap with uh, Pip. And I'll talk to you later. So, folks, now that you've heard Krause's Dream Da Vinci spiel, and it's daylight, why not grab yourself some leftover goodies at my snack shack and hang around a few more hours to take part in our weekly presidential debates at noon. That's right, every Saturday, presidential debates right here. They're dedicated to truth and free to all. And to prove it, here's a 60-second film clip on how things looked last week as the debates got underway. Presidential debates every Saturday afternoon right here at the parking lot at Hotel Originaldo Cinema. Now to the Washington Olympic debates. I'm George Washington. And I'm Abraham Lincoln. I'm David Daniels back here in the Gold Crown. And I'm Richard Krause, up here, fixed up to look like I haven't looked in 35 years. Hey cousin, this is Hollywood, ain't it? You think I look this handsome all the time? <laughs> Anybody here seen my old friend John? Can you tell me where he's gone? Don't get upset, folks. I assure you that President John F. Kennedy and the Reverend Martin Luther King will be returning later in the debate to give us their enlightened ideas on some very important issues. In the meantime, let's begin. Presidents Washington and Lincoln and would-be King David Daniels down there in the center I welcome you all to the Hotel Originaldo Cinema for our first weekly presidential debates. Hold it, cousin. Hold it for a second. Uh, just in case anyone has not read what it says on the wall behind me, I'll read it for them. Okay? Truth talks, bullshit walks. And I hope we can, without too much further ado, proceed peacefully. People seen the good they die young. Okay, folks, hope to see you at today's debate, and until then, I'll be signing autographs at the Snack Shack. A free autograph on every hot dog napkin or kosher pickle wrapper, and two on every Polish sausage wrapper or popcorn bag. See you down there. Oops, I guess it's already later, and here I am. Oh, shit. Just as I thought I was finally finishing up with this video, there's actually only one more minute past this point to watch. I heard about Al Gore's timely and courageous film called Inconvenient Truth. I just had to check and see if Mr. Gore had covered everything and said everything regarding the impact of human recklessness and self-centeredness on Earth and its life forms. If Gore had indeed covered it all, there would be no reason for me to finish this video. Alas, there is a reason for me to finish it. Climate crisis is the most serious challenge we've ever faced. It has the potential to end human civilization. Gore says that we need to stop global warming so that human civilization can continue to survive. I say we need to do it and we need to pursue many other non-global warming issues. Not so our civilization can survive, but so that all life on Earth, whether it includes our so-called civilization or not, can continue to survive in a fashion comparable to that way in which that life had been for millions of years before we began our relatively swift and recent devastation of nature. We need to stop thinking selfishly of only what is important for humans. We need to stop committing crimes against nature. Not because we will be punished by having to live in a greenhouse, 
but because it is morally wrong. 